Canada, a people's history. Proudly presented with the corporate partnership support of Sun Life Financial. And by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Tonight, the English and French networks of the CBC launch the first history of Canada for the television age. This series of documentaries will be broadcast on CBC Television and Radio Canada over the next two years, covering our history from the First Peoples to the end of the 20th century. All the events portrayed in this history actually happened. All the people you see actually lived. All the words they speak were spoken or written by them. I was chosen to join a number of others, to take a perilous voyage to a new world. I resigned myself to silence far from my own country. This is the story of thousands like her, who found much more than exile. A land of mystery and adventure. A story of madmen and visionaries, saints and pirates, in a landscape of terrifying beauty. It is a story of the clash of empires, of battles to possess a continent, the gunfire and bombardment terrorized the whole town. The women and children in great numbers near the citadel were continually in tears, wailing and praying. It is a land swept by great political movements. Would you live and die a slave? Forged in the heat of rebellion. The story of ordinary people caught up in the great currents of history. But the battlefields of empire become the shores of hope. Hope for the adventurous, for the dispossessed, driven by dreams or carried on fever ships. Winter was setting in. My father dug a cave in a riverbank, covered it with turf, and there was our apartment. Oh, how fortunate we felt. We would not have traded that root cellar for a royal palace. And it's the story of millions who followed. The families fleeing persecution. The landless seeking land the abandoned seeking anything. This is the story of how they built a nation that came of age and grew into the world. It is the testament of our fathers and our mothers, the story that shaped who we are. A dramatic and extraordinary story. Our own.
She was a scullery maid in the Newfoundland outport of Exploits Bay, but she held the key to a great mystery. She had been found lost and starving in the winter woods. Her family was dead. The white people gave her shelter and nursed her back to health. The settlers named her Nancy, but she called herself Shauna Divot. They knew she was a Beothic Indian, but nothing more. Where were the rest of her people? The Beothic had always been mysterious. The early European fishermen called them the Red Indians because they painted masks of ochre on their faces. But when the first white settlers came to Newfoundland, the Beothic moved deep into the interior, away from the newcomers. For decades, there was hardly any contact. Then Shauna Divot was found. She came into the care of a St. John's merchant named William Cormack. Cormac was fascinated by the Beothic. He wanted to learn all he could about their history, their legends, and their fate. Shauna Dithit became a woman to be studied. Shauna Dithit is now becoming very interesting as she improves in the English language and gains confidence in people around. I keep her very busily employed in drawing historical representations of everything that suggests itself relating to her tribe, which I find is the best and readiest way of gathering information from her. Shauna Divot described her people to Cormac. Her home had been on the shores of a lake, defended by brambles, bogs, and twisted forests. If Cormac wanted answers about the Beothic, he would have to trek inland to Red Indian Lake. We approached the lake with hope and caution, but found to our mortification that the Red Indians had deserted it for some years past. My party had been excited, so sanguine, so determined to obtain an interview of some kind with these people that on discovering, from appearances everywhere around, that the Red Indians no longer existed, the spirits of one and all of us were deeply affected. It was as if Shauna Dithit had stumbled out of a land of ghosts. Unraveling the mystery of her people had become Cormac's obsession. How did they come to be here? The answers could only be found in unimaginably far-off places. Across an immense continent. For this was a story that began when the world was young. This is a story of ancient migrations and fields of ice. A testament written on the mountainsides. How the Creator made this world, the animals, and man. The 
memory is held by the stones, the drums, and the keepers of the stories. I have lived here since the world began. The Creator made the world, and then he went to rest. And there, on the ground, the stone image. It looks like a man. He breathes into the image. He blows his breath into the image's mouth, and the stone man comes alive. Thousands of years before there was Rome, before Greece, before Egypt and Babylon, people were taking root in the Americas. Eventually, as many as 15 million people lived here. In the northern reaches, the part that would one day be called Canada, more than 50 languages were spoken. They were villagers and nomads, farmers and hunters, peacemakers and warriors. They were the first people, and around fires at night, they shared stories of how their world came to be. There is an Iroquois belief that the first people fell through a hole in the sky onto the back of a giant turtle. The Haida of the West Coast tell of a raven that released them from the clasp of a giant clam. The Blackfoot of the Plains say their creator molded them from mud in the middle of a world of water. But others believe they came from somewhere else. The Salish of the West Coast have passed down stories of a long trek across a great body of water. A long time ago, the people were living in another country, near a large lake, where they were attacked by their enemies. Since they could not cross the water, they were in great danger of being destroyed. That night, one chief caused a cold wind to blow. Ice covered the lake, and at daybreak, the people crossed over the ice to the other side. Then the chief, whose guardian spirit was heat, called a hot wind down, and the ice melted and disappeared behind them so that their enemies could not follow. A hundred thousand years ago, most of this continent was locked in the grip of an ice age. As the ice spread, the ocean levels sank, and whole new masses of land emerged. One of them was hundreds of miles wide, a great land bridge between Asia and America, the gateway to a new world. On one side of the bridge, tribes of people who had already migrated east across Asia. On the other side, an unknown continent. Between 15 and 20,000 years ago, the climate warmed and the glaciers started to melt. Through the barrier of ice, a crack opened up, a passage from the cold northern lands to open country farther south. Across the land bridge came grazing animals, like the caribou, in search of better pastures and the hunters followed.
No one knows who arrived in North America first. No one is certain if the land bridge was the only way to get here, but people came and they were followed by others. They didn't know it was a different continent. They simply followed the food. Along the way, they peopled a new world. The sea levels rose with the runoff from the glaciers and the land bridge was submerged. For the next 10,000 years, the new continent would continue to grow. The flow of people spread out to reach every corner. They first went south, founding great empires, the Inca, the Aztec, the Anasazi, then to the east as far as the Atlantic Ocean. As the generations passed and the earth warmed, their descendants set out on a final migration, north. The hunters became people of the caribou and the deer, people of the seal and the walrus. In a land scraped clean by the ice, these were the first people. By 7,000 years ago, bands of hunters had reached the shores of the Eastern Ocean, completing the vast migration across the continent. Their identities have been lost in the mists of time. But here, on the windswept coast of Labrador, they left evidence of who they were. This is a place of wonder one of the oldest ceremonial grave sites in the world. More than 2,000 years before the Egyptians built their pyramids, long before the invention of the wheel in Mesopotamia, the mourners marched in a grim processional to mark the passing of a 12-year-old child. Little is known about who they were, only that they killed walrus up and down the coast, and that they chose this simple ocean overlook to be a landmark made sacred by death. Red ochre adorned the body's deerskin shroud, and spear points were arranged on the grave floor. And the body was left face down with a boulder on its back, as if to keep it there. On the lonely coast of Labrador, they left a sign that speaks to the ages. In the face of death, the walrus hunters had affirmed that this was their place, and that they would live on. The northern landscape shaped its people. This was a land where people had to rely on each other to survive.
On the plains, the Blackfoot were guided by their god, Nappy, the Old Man. Old Man made the world and everything on it. He had done everything well, except that he put men in one place and women in another, quite a distance away. So they lived separately for a while. One day, Old Man said, I have done everything well, except I made one bad mistake, putting men in one place and women in another. There's no joy or pleasure in that. I must make men mate with women. I will put some pleasure, some good feeling in it. Otherwise, men won't be keen to do what is necessary. I myself will set an example. The men lived in squalor, wearing only rotting skins. But they were skilled hunters, and old man hoped that if the women could see the men, they would want to be with them. The women looked at the men, their matted hair. They smelled the strong smell coming from their unwashed bodies. They looked at their dirty skin. And they said to each other, these beings called men don't know how to live. They're dirty and they smell. We don't want people like these. Then all the women threw rocks and shouted, go away. An old man said it was not a mistake to have these creatures far away from us. Women are dangerous. I shouldn't have created them. But in time, the legend says, the men and women were drawn to each other, finding ways to live together. The roles differed from place to place. In some bands, lineage was determined by a mother's bloodline. In farming cultures, the women grew the crops that fed more mouths than the hunters could feed with meat. Still, the work of butchering animals, tanning skins, and raising the children fell to the women. Warfare and hunting went to the men. And when they worked together, they prospered and gave thanks for all they had received. Old man exclaimed, why these women beings are beautiful. They delight my eyes. Their bodies are sweet smelling and alluring. They make our hearts leap. The old man Nappy was pleased. There would be families here for a long time to come. Now these families would become a people. Nappy, the old man, made many images of clay in the form of the buffalo. Then he said to the people, those are your food. The legends say that Nappy told the people how to kill the buffalo, that they should herd them over cliffs and butcher the carcasses at the bottom. Nappy said, I have given you many gifts and I've showed you how to use them. All sorts of plants for food and medicine. Weapons and knives so that you can kill the buffalo and use the whole carcass. But you still have to do your job. Don't get lazy. In the world of the buffalo, every person had a role. Hunters and shaman, mothers and warriors. The Blackfoot believed you found your role out there in the great silence of the wilderness.
to get some of the power from nature and to find a spirit who would be his protector through life, a boy would go out alone on his vision quest. He would first bathe until he was very clean and he would live alone for three or four or five days without food. Only a strong person can stay until the vision comes, for it often comes first in the form of a dangerous animal. The animal tests the person's courage. If he does not run away from it, something talks to him, something he cannot see. The voice tells him to stay a certain number of nights. At the end of that time, the spirit gives the person power and tells him what his protector will be. In the vision quest, he went out as a boy to return as a warrior. Nappy said, here I'll mark you off a piece of ground and he did so. Then he said, there is your land, and it is full of all kinds of animals, and many things grow in this land. Let no other people come into it. When people come to cross the line, take your bows and arrows, and give them battle, and keep them out. If they gain a footing, trouble will come to you. In all of the northern continent, there were those who were so different that they truly stood apart. The Inuit. There is a giant that lives in the north. When he blows his breath, violent snowstorms occur. Other spirits live to the east and west. The thunder is the noise of them running across the sky. They did not trace their origins back to the Great Migration after the last Ice Age. They came thousands of years later, by sea from the west, long after the land bridge had disappeared and they settled in a place where the struggle to survive was posed in its starkest form. The Inuit lived with no room for mistakes. It was essential that they use everything they could to survive. From a single caribou came clothes for the winter. Sinews were woven into thread. Marrow was cracked from its bones, and its fat was rendered into fuel. One story shows what the Inuit valued most, a stubborn will to survive and the ingenuity that went with it. An old man was left in an igloo with two dogs and little else as his family moved on. But he wasn't ready to die just yet. He fashioned a knife from his frozen feces. He killed one dog to feed the other dog and himself. From the skin, he made a coat. From the bones and guts, a sled. Then he hitched up the remaining dog 
and rode off to rejoin his family. Even the creation legends speak of survival and death. A woman went to live among strangers. She became a burden. So they put all their belongings into a sealskin boat. They seized the woman and cast her overboard. She struggled to regain the side of the boat, so they cut off her fingers. She screamed her determination to have revenge. Thrashing in the frigid water, the woman was transformed. She became Sedna, goddess of the sea and the mother of all beasts. Her thumb became the walrus, her first finger a seal, and her middle finger the white bear. When the first two animals see a human, they try to escape. When the white bear sees a man, filled with revenge, he tries to kill the person who he believes mutilated the woman from whose finger he sprang. Why did they come here? Across trackless miles and through the generations, the Inuit followed the whales and the seals, the caribou and the muskox. They had learned the secret of this land of midnight sun. Behind the harshness, there was an abundance of life. They lived in small clusters, scattered across the top of the world, islands of subsistence in a universe of ice, a people always balanced between life and death. Down through the generations, storytellers taught the importance of tradition and passed on songs and dances as unique as the people themselves. Dancing for us is not only a right or a privilege, it is an obligation. It is a strict law that bids us dance. It is one of the ways we carry on our responsibilities. cannibal bird dance of the Kwakutl, the sun dance of the Blackfoot, the spirit dances of the Anishinaabe, traditions to mark every aspect of life, from harvesting corn, to the puberty of a girl, to the preparation for war. Nothing was more important than defending ancestral land, and there would always be aggressors. In ancient times, feuding and warfare were endemic. The warriors roamed the countryside, killing and scalping the inhabitants of the settlements that lay scattered across the forest. The Cree crossed the tree line to raid Inuit camps. On the west coast, nations sent war parties to sea in cedar canoes. The Blackfoot believed their creator gave them the ferocity to fend for what was theirs. In the land of the Great Lakes, the people were farmers. They surrounded their palisaded villages with fields, spreading wider with each new crop. The Huron, then known as the Wendat, 
lived near the most warlike of all the eastern people, the Iroquois. For generations, these people had been enemies, locked in a cycle of deadly raids and fierce retaliation. The warrior struck quickly, then silently escaped, finding a way back to safety through dangerous, unfamiliar territory. fate of all was to be captured alive. This was the day his long and painful death began. It was a ritual. Both victim and captor had their parts to play. Both understood what was to come. They shared a code of honor, retribution, and suffering. Both knew that if the fortunes of war were different, their positions might easily have been reversed. Brother, you have come to die in the land of the Wendat. The warrior had spent a lifetime preparing for this day, praying that his courage would not fail, that his passage to the next world would not be tainted by dishonor. Instead of crying out, he sang a mournful death song, lifting his spirit above the pain. A true warrior could endure for days. Brother, you were cruel, too. This was a public ceremony, an affirmation of a people's solidarity in the face of their enemies. They would be protected. Their warriors would strike fear into their enemies' hearts. Any invader would be destroyed. The torturer had a responsibility, too, to carry out his gruesome duty calmly, even with a kind of compassion. He, too, was being judged by his people and by the spirits. Enough, brother? Finally, the warrior was released from suffering taken out to die a hero's death. But now there would be more raids, more retaliation, more victims. The cycle of warfare and death seemed endless. In these times, the Iroquois people themselves were fractured into five warring camps. The Oneida, Cayuga, Onondaga, Seneca, and Mohawk. They tell of a mystical being, a Huron named Deganawida, 
who arrived on a mission to bring the Iroquois back together into a peaceful confederation. The Gunner Weaver comes to the Mohawk settlement. He spends the night on the shore of the river near the settlement. When next morning, the inhabitants of the settlement see smoke from his fire, their chief sends a scout to go and fetch Liganawida. Before accepting the message of peace, Liganawida must be tested in order to see if he possesses supernatural power. Liganawida climbs a tree, and as he sits perched at the very top, the warriors cut down the tree so that it falls over a precipice into the gorge. And Diganawida disappears into the river of the turbulent waters. Next morning, a young man walks and sees smoke rising from near a cornfield. He comes closer, and recognizing Daganawida, runs to tell his chief. With each chief, Daganawida had to pass a test until he succeeded in convincing all five Iroquois nations to form a union to govern a crowded landscape. And each nation shall contribute one arrow to form a single strong bundle bound with the sinew of a deer. So joined, these arrows represent the Confederacy's solidarity. He warns them that if any arrows are withdrawn from the bundle that represents the power of their solidarity, the bundle of arrows will weaken. The Iroquois Alliance made them the strongest political and military force in eastern North America. But within a few decades, they would face an unimaginable challenge from the other side of the world. The native people of North America didn't venture out to explore any other continent. But from across the ocean, others would come to them. Sometime during the first millennium in Europe, a radical new idea emerged. There was something out there, some new land beyond the Atlantic horizon. One of the earliest mentions is a far-fetched story of an Irish monk named Brendan. The story says that in the year 565, Brendan and 17 disciples went searching for a land of solitude. They sailed for seven years, a journey fraught with danger through undiscovered waters. Monsters rose off their bow. Mermaids swam in their wake. Brendan even claimed to have held mass on the back of a whale. And then the monks came to land. Their small boat bobbed perilously close to the forbidding rocks of the coastline. Soldiers of Christ, be strong in faith unfeigned, and in the armor of the Spirit, for we are now in the confines of hell. Watch therefore, and act manfully. A few centuries passed in Europe before the next stories emerged of a new world, this time told by the Vikings. The Vikings were marauders, feared and loathed in Europe before they sailed west, first to Iceland, then Greenland. They were expert seamen, and they continued west until land loomed on their horizon. 
they found a small sheltered bay at the end of a great peninsula. They built a wayfaring station and a repair depot for their ships and settled in for the winter. But the Vikings discovered there were people here, people they called Skraelings, after trolls in Scandinavian myth. The Vikings encountered a small group of these people and killed them. From that day, the settlement became a target. They were ill-favored men with ugly hair on their heads. They had big eyes and were broad in the cheeks. They hissed like geese. Though the quality of the land was admirable, there would always be fear and strife docking them on account of those who already inhabited it. So they made ready to leave. At the time, no one took the Viking stories seriously. And for 400 years, the great expeditions were heading somewhere else, to the east. Vast caravans to fabled Cathay and India, bringing back gold, silk, cinnamon, pearls, and pepper. This was Europe. 50 million people, with its great capitals and city-states, Paris, London, Venice, Genoa. Much of Europe's wealth came from its trade with Asia. And Constantinople was the gateway that connected them. Then, in 1453, a disaster for Europe. Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Turks. Now Europe needed a new trade route to Asia and looked west across the Atlantic. No one suspected there might be an entire continent in the way. There was not only an entire continent across the Atlantic. There was a different universe, full of its own peoples and societies. Over 500 generations, North America had become a continent of nations unlike anything the world had ever seen. The northern part was occupied and claimed by hundreds of tribes dozens of distinct peoples, each with its own way of life, its own gods, its own kind of wealth, its own name and lands. The Northwest was the land of the Dene, the Athapascan, the Slavey and the Dog Rib, the Tuchoni, the Klinget, and the Guichen. In the Arctic, the distant, isolated world of the Inuit. Along the Pacific coast, the Haida, the Salish, the Kwakutl and the Yukwat, the Nishka and the Gitsan. The people of the plains, the Blackfoot, the Blood, the Sarsi and the Pagan. In the northern woodlands, the Cree and the Chipewyan. Near the Great Lakes, the Anishinaabe, the Algonquin, the farmers and warriors of the Iroquois and the Wendat. In the east, the nations of the Beothic, the Maliseet, the Innu, the Abnaki, and the Mi'kmaq. They knew the land as their own. Corners of the country they called Dununde, Nunavut, Kanata, Canada. The Beothic woman, Shauna Dithit, 
had drawn some maps for her guardian, William Cormac, to help him find the lost nation of the Beothic. He followed the maps deep into the interior, but found no one. Then he realized the answers were in the maps themselves. Shauna Divot had drawn stick figures, one group moving away from the other. She drew her own people in red. Food had been scarce inland, and they hadn't moved far enough to avoid European disease. With no immunity, the Beothic started to die. Then she drew some figures in black to represent gangs of white men. Some settlers considered the Beothic to be thieves. There were stories that they hunted the Beothic down for bounty, killing everyone they could find. Shauna Diffit received two gunshot wounds at two different times, from shots fired at the band she was with by the English people. One wound was that of a slug, or a buckshot that went through the palm of her hand. The other was a shot through her leg. Disease, starvation, massacres. Shauna Divid had always known the truth. Now William Cormac did too. Britons have trespassed here to be a blight and a scourge to a portion of the human race a defenseless and once independent, proud tribe of men have nearly been extirpated from the face of the earth, scarcely causing an inquiry how or why. They have been dislodged and disappeared from the earth. There were white settlers in other parts of Canada by now, some living alongside native people, some pushing them aside. By 1829, in Newfoundland, there was just one Beothic left, and Shauna Dithit had tuberculosis. Died at St. John's, Newfoundland, on the 6th of June last, in the 29th year of her age. Shauna Dithit, supposed to be the last of the Red Indians or Beothics. In Newfoundland, there has been a primitive nation, once claiming rank as a portion of the human race, that has lived, flourished, and now become extinct in their own orbit. Shauna Divot's skull was packed in a metal box and sent to England to be studied in a laboratory. Attached to the shipment was a note. The skull and scalp of Nancy Beothic, red Indian, female. She was tall and majestic, mild and tractable, but characteristically proud and cautious. Not all the native peoples of North America would share Shauna Divid's tragic fate, but none could avoid contact with outsiders. And when that happened, the whole course of human history changed. New ties would be forged, and old gods challenged. Neither side was sure the other was even human. It is a drama that would shape the destiny of this land. First Contact. The European discovery of America launched one of the greatest adventures in world history. In Europe, it would dictate the fate of empires. Here, it would lead through dark forests and across deserts of ice. In a quest for riches, land, and human souls, a story written on a landscape as vast as the ocean.
These people have come from across the great water in wonderfully large canoes with great white wings like those of a huge bird. The men have long, sharp knives and black cubes which they point at birds and animals. Smoke from the black cubes rise in the air like smoke from our pipe. These men are strange in appearance. Their skin is white like snow. The land mass before them was so immense that it took almost 300 years before European sailors touched its three shores, the Atlantic, Arctic, and Pacific. And on each of these shores, there are stories of those first defining encounters. In the east, French explorer Jacques Cartier would encounter a powerful chief along the river of Canada. In the north, an Englishman named Henry Hudson would risk mutiny and death while trying to find the Northwest Passage. On the Pacific shores, a young sailor would be plunged into a world beyond his wildest imagination. But at first, this was a world that no one expected or wanted to find, an obstacle in the way of the real European dream, a passage to China. Christopher Columbus got it wrong. He sailed west from Spain in 1492 to cross the Atlantic, then mistakenly declared that the Caribbean islands he found were the shores of Asia. Signor Christopher Columbus of Genoa had discovered the coast of India and it was spoken of grandly. It was more divine than human to have found that way never before known to get to the Orient from where the spices originate. The English were convinced they had to send their own expedition west to get at these spices. Five years after Columbus, Henry VII gazed toward the western horizon and decided there was not an English sailor capable of making such a trip. He had a talented Mediterranean navigator in mind. Well beloved John Cabot, citizen of Venice, is granted full and free authority to seek out, discover, and find whatsoever isles, countries, regions, or provinces of the heathen and infidels, in what part of the world soever they be, which before this time have been unknown to all Christians. He was born Giovanni Cabotto. But under the banners of the King of England, he sailed as John Cabot. He left Bristol on May 2nd, 1497, on a ship christened the Matthew. Cabot set a northerly course. A month later, he sighted land. New, found land. The events were recorded by a Bristol merchant, John Day. Cabot landed at only one spot on the mainland, very near the place where they first sighted. They disembarked there with a crucifix, raised banners with the arms of the Holy Father and those of the King of England. They found tall trees of the kinds masts are made. They found a trail that led inland. They saw a site where a fire had been made. They saw manure of animals, and they saw a stick, a half yard long, pierced at both ends, carved and painted. And by such signs, they believed the land to be inhabited. 
And thus, following the shore, they saw two forms running on land, one after the other. But they couldn't tell if they were human beings or animals. Since, as he was with just a few people, he did not dare advance inland, <laughs> beyond the shooting distance of a crossbow. And after that, taking fresh water, he returned to his ship. John Cabot spent only a few hours on the shores of the New World. Back in Bristol, he was received as a hero. He had claimed new land for England, and he said there were so many fish in the waters off this newfound land that they could be caught with a basket lowered over the side of a boat. That was all the fishermen of Bristol needed to hear. It wasn't long before other fishermen joined in, from the Basque country and Spain, Portugal and France. They found enough cod to feed all the stomachs of Europe. The next year, Cabot went back on a new expedition, but this time it ended in disaster. He is believed to have found the new lands nowhere but on the very bottom of the ocean, to which he is believed to have descended together with his ship, himself the victim of the self-same ocean, since after that voyage he was never seen again. By the year 1500, only three years after Cabot, the island of Newfoundland had become a beacon for European fishermen. But rarely had sailors explored onshore to see what other wealth might be found there. Then, a Portuguese merchant came back with news. He had found people. He kidnapped 50 of them and shipped them back to Lisbon. Merchants waited at the docks, among them an Italian diplomat. I have seen, touched, and examined these people, and beginning with their stature, declare that they are somewhat taller than our average. They appear to me to be in all else of the same form and image as ourselves. They may appear to be savages, yet they are gentle and have a strong sense of shame. And are better made in the legs, arms, and shoulders than it is possible to describe, admirably fitted to endure labor and will probably turn out to be the best slaves that have been discovered up to this time. The Newfoundland Indians could not endure their exposure to the Europeans. All of them died, and the merchants turned their attention back to the fish. In the summer of 1534, French explorer Jacques Cartier was frustrated. He had been sent to North America not for fish nor for people. He was charged by his king, Francois I, to find a trade passage through the continent to the Pacific and on to the Orient. Cartier left the French seaport of Saint-Malo and set a course for Newfoundland. Then through the Strait of Belle Isle. And then, nothing. Cartier found just confusing shoreline, fog, and dead ends. I am rather inclined to believe that this is the land God gave to Cain. Cartier marked each new bay and promontory on his charts. Baie des Châteaux, Ile de l'Assomption, 
Bay du Saint-Laurent. And then Cartier came upon men. There are people on this coast whose bodies are fairly well formed. But they are wild and savage folk. Cartier sent some of his men ashore, loaded with trade goods. As soon as they saw us, they began making signs that they had come to barter with us, and held up some skins of small value with which they clothed themselves. We offered them some knives and other iron goods to give to their chief. They parted all they had to such an extent that they went back naked without anything on them. And they made signs to us that they would return on the morrow with more skins. With winter approaching, Cartier would soon have to leave. Other than some new maps and encounters with natives, his expedition had revealed nothing. He was determined to come back in the spring to pick up where he left off. So Cartier planted a cross to claim this land for France. chief was dressed in an old black bear skin. Pointing to the cross, he made us a long harangue, making a sign of the cross with his two fingers. And then he pointed to the land all around about, as if he wished to say that the region belonged to him, and we ought not to set up the cross without his permission. Donna Connor, chief of the Stadacona people, Cartier recognized an adversary when he saw one. We held up an axe to him, pretending we would barter it for his skins. At this he nodded assent, and little by little come near the side of our vessel, thinking he would have the axe. But one of our men who was in our dinghy caught hold of his canoe, and at once Two or three more stepped down into it and made them come on board our vessel, at which they were greatly astonished. Cartier had not only seized Donna Connor, but his two sons as well, Domagaya and Tagnawagne. We explained to them by signs that the cross had been set up to serve as a landmark and guidepost on coming into the harbor, and that we would soon come back and would bring them iron wares and other goods. We told him that we wished to take two of his sons away with us, and afterwards would bring them back again to that harbor. Cartier dressed the sons in European clothes and told Donna Connor that they would meet the King of France, then come back the following spring to act as his guides. Then Cartier could sail directly into the river and beyond, to the Orient. Paris in the winter of 1534. Damagaya and Tagnawagne had found themselves at the height of the Renaissance amidst dukes and duchesses, artists and scholars. Among them, a prominent clergyman, André Tevez. He was the king's cosmographer, 
a man of reason who explained the mysteries of the universe and the complexities of the new world. The king was hoping that even though this country did not bring him much revenue, it would at least bring him immortal honor and the grace of God to have rescued this barbarous people from ignorance and to render it to the Christian church. Teve conjured a myth of a native North America. It was a godless, yet surprisingly peaceful place. He imagined a simple nobility, a people who lived an admirable existence, yet could be easily conquered. They have neither cities, nor castles, nor machines of war like us. Cartier managed to convince King Francois that it was worth sending him back on another expedition, back to Canada. Canada. It was what Tagnoagne and Domagaya called their father's village at Stadacona. Jacques Cartier added the name to his map. Before long, Damagaya and Tagnoagne were back at their father's fire, telling him of the things they had seen on the other side of the ocean. Donna Connor didn't trust the French and now refused to help them. Cartier and his crew would have to continue upriver alone. No other European had ever made this journey into the interior. After sailing for 150 miles, they landed at a large island on October the 2nd, 1535. We marched on, and about half a league thence, found that the land began to be cultivated. It was fine land, with large fields covered with the corn of the country. And in the middle of these fields is situated and stands the village of Oshulaga near and adjacent to a mountain, the slopes of which are fertile and cultivated, and from the top of which one can see for a long distance. We named this mountain Mont Royal. Through the gates of Hochelaga, Cartier crossed into another civilization. They have a plant of which a large supply is collected in summer for the winter's consumption. After drying it in the sun, they crumble this plant into powder, which they place in one of the openings of a hollow instrument. And laying a live coal on top, suck at the other end to such an extent that they fill their bodies so full of smoke that it streams out of their mouths and nostrils as from a chimney. Cartier was like an apparition to them, so strange he seemed divine. At once, many sick persons, some blind, others with but one eye, others lame or impotent, and, and others again so extremely old, that their eyelids hung down to their cheeks, were brought in and set down or laid out near me in order that I might lay my hands upon them, so that one would have thought Christ had come down to earth to heal them. But I'm more than ever of the opinion that these people would be easy to convert to our holy faith. Cartier played the role of a healing man to find out how to continue on to the Orient. But he was desperately short of time. He had to leave soon or risk being frozen in until spring. Finally, Cartier was forced to make a run back to the Atlantic. 
but the ice caught his ships near Donnacona's stronghold at Stadacona. He and his men were not prepared for this. They began to succumb to scurvy. The sickness broke out among us accompanied by the most extraordinary symptoms. For some lost all their strength, their legs became swollen and inflamed, and all had their mouths so tainted that the gums rotted away down to the roots of the teeth, which nearly fell out. The disease spread among the three ships to such an extent that in the middle of February, of the 110 men forming our company, there were not 10 in good health. I gave orders for all to pray and to make horizons, and had an image and figure of the Virgin Mary carried across the ice and snow and placed against a tree, and issued an order that on the following Sunday, Mass should be said at that spot, praying the Virgin to be good enough to ask her dear son to have pity upon us. At that time, so many were down with the disease that we had almost lost hope of ever returning to France. When God, His infinite goodness and mercy, had pity upon us. Mercy did come from Donna Connor's sons. They boiled some cedar boughs to make a cloudy black elixir. Then they instructed Cartier to have his men drink it. At once, I ordered a drink to be prepared for the sick man, but none of them would taste it. At length, one or two thought they would risk a trial. And as soon as they had drunk it, they felt better which must clearly be ascribed to miraculous causes. For after drinking it two or three times, they recovered health and strength, and were cured of all the diseases they had ever had. Twenty-five of Cartier's men were dead by the time the ice loosened its grip, and Cartier still had nothing to show his king. He would need something enticing to win another passage back to Canada. Something from Donna Connor. Jacques Cartier had a plan. He would invite the chief and his sons to join him on his ship, La Grande Hermine, for the Feast of the Holy Cross. Eventually, cautiously, Donna Connor accepted. Which pleased us, as we were in hopes of being able to capture them. They arrived about two o'clock in the afternoon, and as soon as they came opposite to our ships, I went and greeted Donna Connor, who likewise was friendly enough, but kept his eye constantly fixed on the wood and was wonderfully uneasy. I begged him to come on board the ships to eat and to drink. At this, I issued orders for the seizure of Donna Kona, Tegnaogni, Domagaya. At nightfall, a large number of Donna Kona's people came opposite our ships, the river between us howling and crying like wolves all night long, calling out incessantly, Donna Kona, Donna Kona, in the hope of being able to speak to him. I gave orders for Donna Kona to address them, 
and I told him to be of good cheer, for that after he had had an interview with the King of France, his master, he would be able within ten or twelve moons to come back. But Donna Connor would never come back. He was taken to Europe and languished there. He tried vainly to get home, spinning tales of a land of riches called the Saginaw that lay beyond towering waterfalls and treacherous rapids. He told the cosmographer, André Teve, that he would lead them to these riches if only he could return to Canada. The king of the country, called Donacona, died in France, a good Christian, in the time of King Francois, spoke French very well, having lived there four years. I saw and spoke with him to be more certain of the singularities of his country. And he told me that his elders had told him that when a man came to earth, a new star was formed in the sky, which appeared in the sky to be the guide of this man. Whereas, on the contrary, when a man, woman, son or daughter came to pass away and leave Canada, a star was lost in the sky, never to be seen again. Henry Hudson braved the forbidding Arctic in search of a route to China. Instead, he would unlock one of the great secrets of the North and pay a terrible price. In 1609, the English king, James I, called on Hudson to sail to the Arctic. Hudson was eminently qualified he had sailed through Russia's northern seas, and he had been to Greenland and the edge of the polar ice. By June 1610, Hudson was steering his ship, the Discovery, along Baffin Island's south shore into a waterway he called the Hudson Strait. As he pressed further into this frigid place, he added other new names to his charts, the Island of Good Fortune, God's mercies, hold with hope, desire provoketh. Days turned into weeks. The desolation of the Arctic descended around the crew. Tensions spread as the ice flows threatened to freeze them in until spring. One of the only literate crew members kept a diary, a man named Abacuc Prickett. We had a storm, and the wind brought the ice so fast upon us that in the end we were driven to put her into the chiefest of the ice and there to let her lie. It was a labyrinth without end. Hudson headed south, desperately searching for another outlet to the ocean. His men protested. They wanted to go back the way they came. Hudson would not hear of it. Then he ran the discovery into a dead end at the bottom of the bay. Here our master was in despair, for he thought we should never have got out of this ice, but there have perished. To speak of all our troubles would be too tedious. They were trapped in another realm, stranded in a place they deemed unfit for man. The crewmen blamed their captain for their plight, stuck here through the long, bitter winter with no contact from anyone. Until a man came out of the scrub trees on the shoreline. He was a native trapper and he had come to trade. To this savage, 
our master gave a knife, a looking glass, and buttons, who received them thankfully, and made signs that after he had slept, he would come again, which he did. And when he came, he brought with him a sled, which he drew after him, and upon it, two deer skins and two beaver skins. This was the first modest transaction on the bay that would bear Hudson's name. In time, one of the world's greatest fur trade empires would be built here. But for the crew of the Discovery, it was just another day closer to death. It was June when the ice broke into a maze of flows and open water, and Hudson still had every intention of finding the Northwest Passage. This was devastating news to the crew. They turned to plans of mutiny. Wilson the bosun and Henry Green came to me and told me that they and the rest of their associates would shift the company and turn the master and all the sick men into the shallop and let them shift for themselves. When I heard this, I told them that for their sakes they should not commit so foul a thing in the sight of God and man. Henry Green bade me hold my peace, for he knew the worst, which was to be hanged when he came home. And therefore, of the two, he'd rather be hanged at home than starved abroad. The master came out of his cabin. Wilson bound his arms behind him. We asked them what they meant. They told him he should know when he was in the shallop. Then the shallop was hauled up to the ship's side, and the poor, sick, and lame men were called upon to get them out of their cabins and into the shallop. Among those put into the boat with Hudson was his son, John. They kept pace with the discovery for a few days, then fell back over the horizon and out of sight. No trace of Hudson was ever found, but Hudson's Bay would prove to be the northern gateway into the very heart of the continent. In the 18th century, there were few British heroes as great as Captain James Cook. It was as if he had conquered the world, Antarctica, Polynesia, New Zealand, Australia, and the Sandwich Islands. By 1778, he was heading towards the uncharted waters off the west coast of North America. He was looking for the outlet of the Northwest Passage. Instead, he came upon an entire civilization unknown to white men. The people didn't know what on earth it was when the ship came into the harbor. The people went out to the ship. They thought they were looking at fish come alive into people. They were taking a real good look at those white people on the deck there. One white man had a real hooked nose, and one of the people said to another, See, he must have been a dog salmon, that one there. He's got a hooked nose. They called their village Uquat, but the name got muddled in the first clumsy conversation between the natives and Captain Cook. On my arrival in this inlet, I had honored it with the name of King George's Sound, but I afterwards found but it is called Nootka by the natives. The people started talking our language to them, telling them to go around the sound to drop anchor. They were saying, Nootka is him, Nootka is him, which means you go around the harbor. Captain Cook says, oh, they're telling us the name of this place is Nootka. And that's how Nutka got its name. 
A great many canoes filled with natives were about the ships all day, and trade commenced betwixt us and them, which was carried on with the strictest honesty on both sides. The articles which they offered for sale were the skins of various animals. In exchange, they took knives, chisels, pieces of iron and tin, nails, looking glasses, buttons, or any kind of metal. Nothing would go down with our visitors but metal. Before we had left the place, there was hardly a bit of it left on the ships, except what belonged to our necessary instruments. Cook's men wanted something else. They offered pewter plates and cutlery so that women would be brought to the ships. Two of the officers joined in, David Samwell and Charles Clerk. These are the dirtiest set of people I've ever met with. They're continuously rubbing their faces and bodies all over with one set of filth or another. On this constant repetition, the dirt is so mm. ingrained in the skin that it's absolutely hard to tell what colour our good Mother Nature originally gave them. The girls, who, in order to render themselves agreeable to us, are taken great pains to rub their faces and hair with red ochre. However, our young gentlemen, we're not going to take this as an obstacle. They were uh, prevailed upon to sleep on board the ships, or rather, they were forced to it. In 1803, the trade ship Boston sailed into Nootka Sound. On board was a 19-year-old Englishman named John Jewett. He was a blacksmith, an occupation that would save his life. I had never before beheld a savage of any nation. It may readily be supposed that the novelty of their appearance, so different from any people I had hitherto seen, excited in me strong feelings of surprise and curiosity. I was, however, particularly struck with the looks of their king, who was a man of a dignified aspect, about six feet in height and extremely straight and well proportioned. He had an air of savage magnificence. His name was McQuinna. He was a chief and a power broker. His village at Nootka had become a wealthy trading post in the 25 years since Captain Cook's visit. McQuinna's people had come to depend on metal goods forged by the traders. But hatred festered between the natives and the whites. There had been arguments and violence, rapes and beatings, even murder. Then, John Jewett's ship arrived. The captain of the Boston gave McQuinna a fowling gun as a present. In return, McQuinna gave him nine ducks, but he broke the gun. McQuinna was scolded like a careless child in front of his warriors. He spoke not a word in reply, but his countenance sufficiently expressed the rage he felt though he exerted himself to suppress it. And I observed him, while the captain was speaking, repeatedly put his hand to his throat and rub it upon his bosom, which he afterwards told me was to keep down his heart, which was rising into his throat and choking him. 
The next day, McQuinna was back, this time performing a dance for the assembled crew of the Boston, acting as if nothing had happened. Over his face, he wore a very ugly mask of wood, representing the head of some wild beast. He appeared to be remarkably good-humored and gay, entertaining us with a variety of antic tricks and gestures. I fell stunned and senseless upon the floor. I was, however, soon recalled to my recollection by three loud shouts or yells from the savages, which convinced me that they had got possession of the ship. It is impossible to describe my feelings at this terrific sound. I looked up to see savages standing in a circle around me, covered with the blood of my murdered comrades, with their daggers uplifted in their hands, prepared to strike. He then asked me if I would be his slave during my life, if I would fight for him in his battles, if I would repair his muskets and make daggers and knives for him, to all of which I was careful to answer. Yes. The Boston was emptied and scuttled. McQuinn's men had cut off the heads of Jewett's fellow crew members and forced him to identify them one by one. Then McQuinna held a potlatch. It was a feast, a dance, and a triumphant show of power, where a chief would welcome his guests by lavishing his excess riches on them. I had determined from the first of my capture to adopt a conciliating conduct toward them and conform myself, as far as was in my power, to their customs and mode of thinking, trusting that the same divine goodness that had rescued me from death would not always suffer me to languish in captivity among these heathens. Jewett was exposed to an unbelievable wealth of ancient nations, among them the Nutka, the Maka, the Haida, the Salish, and the Kwakutl. They cut through the ocean in huge hand-carved cedar canoes. They were artists and dancers, mystics and whalers, headhunters and cannibals. They boasted great wealth, worshipped wolf spirits and thunderbirds. Jewett became a constant companion to McQuinna at Nootka and on his visits to other tribes. Summers turned into winters, and still no rescue ships came into the sound. Meanwhile, to McQuinna, Jewett became less of a slave and more of a son, so much so that in time he arranged for Jewett to be married. I remonstrated against this decision, but to no purpose, for he told me that should I refuse, I would be put to death. A blacksmith from England, now a husband at Nootka. Jewett fell further into the world of Nootka Sound, succumbing to its customs and rhythms. He even came to comprehend the massacre of his crewmates on the Boston. Here, I cannot but indulge a reflection that has frequently occurred to me on the manner in which our people behave towards the natives. 
For though they are a thievish race, yet I have no doubt that many of the melancholy disasters have principally arisen from the imprudent conduct of some of the captains and crews of the ships employed in this trade in exasperating them by insulting, plundering, and even killing them on slight grounds. On the morning of the 19th of July, a day that will be ever held by me in grateful remembrance of the mercies of God, my ears were saluted by the joyful sound of three cannon and the cries of the inhabitants exclaiming, strangers, white men. It was an American ship, the Lydia. McQuinna wanted to trade but he feared retribution for the massacre of the Boston's crew. He could neither read nor write, so he turned to Jewett to compose a letter of introduction to the American captain. He said, John, you no lie. But Jewett did lie. He wrote a rescue plea that sent McQuinna into a trap. I found McQuinna in irons, with a guard over him. He looked very melancholy, but on seeing me, his countenance brightened up. I asked the captain's permission to take off his irons, assuring him that as I was with him, there was no danger of his being in the least troublesome. McQuinna bartered some otter skins for a great coat. Then, he made ready to leave the Lydia and do it. I felt a sincere pleasure in freeing from fetters a man who, though he had caused the death of my poor comrades, had nevertheless always proved my friend and protector. Then, grasping both my hands with much emotion, as the tears trickled down his cheeks, he bade me farewell and stepped into the canoe which immediately paddled him on shore. Notwithstanding my joy at my deliverance and the pleasing anticipation I felt of once more beholding a civilized country and again being permitted to offer up my devotions in a Christian church, I could not avoid experiencing a painful sensation on parting with this savage chief who had preserved my life. And in general, treated me with kindness. John Jewett never shook the effects of his time among the Nutka. He wrote a book about his adventure. He turned that into a song, then a play, and went around peddling his tale to anyone who would listen. It haunted him until he died at age 37. Years later, a French trader sailed into Nootka Sound. It was quiet, except for the approach of an aging arthritic man in a canoe. He was carrying a small load of otter pelts. He was McQuinna, and he was still eager to trade. 